summer 2010, claiming that Liliane Bettencourt has been exploited by several members of her entourage, her daughter Françoise decides to prove this by handing over to the authorities covert audio tapes recorded at her mother's house. A few months later, although she has always been extremely discreet, indeed secretive, Liliane Bettencourt in turn chooses to risk public revelations. She opens the gates of her private residence on Rue de la Bordère to television cameras, accepting questions on her private life, her fortune, and even her mental health. and viewers discover the richest woman in the world and one of the most secretive. But what the audience also discover is her family, a family which is truly extraordinary, not like any other. And there we are. This family, so rich and so mysterious, awoke my desire to make this film. To understand its history, reveal its structure, penetrate the shadows, and enter this kingdom, bearing the name of a brand famous worldwide, which, like the Eiffel Tower or the Louvre, seem to constitute part of French patrimony. The Betancourt Affair. What a scandal we discover that Françoise, Liliane's daughter, has been in conflict for years with a writer-photographer, François-Marie Bagnier, on whom her mother has bestowed gifts of hundreds of millions of euros. The Betancourt affair is about money, enormous amounts of money, and also about secrets. It's not just anyone we're talking about here. A leading international cosmetics group, the richest woman in the world, an ex-minister, very far-reaching networks. Money is absolutely everywhere. We have no idea what it's like to be that rich. The sums are astronomical. Everything is counted in millions. There's no small change at the Betancourt's. It's wads of banknotes. It's a very French story, like a Balzac novel, combining enormous success but also deeply buried secrets, which remain hidden for a very long time, and then which suddenly emerge spontaneously like jets of acid, a repressed part of French history. The real paradox is that it's this family, whose essence from the beginning was extreme discretion, which gave rise to this scandal which has become one of the major public scandals of recent years. But what in reality should have been kept hidden? That millionaires are rich, have different lifestyles to you and I? Big surprise. No, although the sums of money at stake are breathtaking, the Betancourt affair is not primarily a story of money, and the most compelling secrets are of a different nature. But to understand them, we need to look further back, leaving for a moment Liliane Betancourt and her immense fortune, and focusing on a man who died 60 years ago, a man both brilliant and terrifying, her father, Eugène Schuller, whose ghost haunts this whole series of events. Let's go back in time. We're in Paris at the start of the last century. Between 1900 and 1914, the city radiates glory. Artists from all over the world contribute to her beauty. Shops, offices, and cinemas spring up like mushrooms, and Paris becomes the second financial capital of the world. Almost three million people live there, and a million workers toil in the thousands of businesses of the capital. It's what's known as the Belle Époque, the beautiful era, even if it's not beautiful for everybody which is clear to little Eugène, the father of Liliane Betancourt and the founder of L'Oréal, from his earliest childhood, as he is the only infant to survive. He's the fifth son of Charles and Amélie Schuller, cook and domestic servant, respectively. They're optants, as it's called, who chose in 1871 to leave areas annexed by Germany and move to French territory. They're very modest folk. They open a bakery on Rue de Cherche Midi with their savings. Little Riquet, as he's nicknamed, the youngest Schuller, 
helps out in the bakery before school. He'll later say, I was an apprentice while a schoolboy, then a worker while a student. It's a fairly modest, fairly humble upbringing. He isn't born into poverty, but they're really tradespeople. Nothing suggests the fabulous career he'll have as an industrialist and inventor and creator of the immense Betancourt fortune. He's very brilliant. He attends the elite Condorcet High School despite his parents' limited means. After graduation, he wants to go on to an elite university, but his parents really don't have the money. So after many jobs, he studies chemistry, graduating at the top of his year in 1904. After finishing at the institute, he becomes assistant to a professor at the Sorbonne University, Professor Auger. And right at that moment, there's a hairdresser in Paris who's doing the circuit of the chemistry professors, trying to find someone who wants to help him to find synthetic dyes, because at that time the products were no good. And Eugène Chaleur raises his hand and says, I'll work on that tonight. And he resolves this hair question. And that's how he starts out in the world of hairdressing, kind of by chance. He starts to work with the hairdresser. I think he was earning 50 francs a month. Pretty soon he saw he didn't need the hairdresser. So then he sets up the foundations of what would become L'Oréal. He tested his first hair dyes on Lillian's mother, Betsy. They were living in a tiny apartment. There was the bedroom, and next to it, a kitchen, where he had his laboratory. And so Eugène Chulot tested his hair dyes on his wife's hair at night, and during the day, he made the rounds of the stores and hair salons to place his products. So he starts with a very small operation. Very small indeed, and in locations which are totally unstylish, mocked by comic films of the time, as if nothing important could take place there, certainly not the birth of an empire. It's still a carefree time, and no one suspects the horror which lies just ahead. In 1914, when World War I breaks out, Lilian Betancourt's father is 33 years old and facing a prosperous future as head of a business. He could have kept his head down, avoided the fighting. He rushes to join up. He initially joins a scientific unit, working on research on chemical warfare. He then succeeds in joining an artillery unit and participates in many engagements. Decorated several times for bravery, he comes back from the war covered in glory to discover that his business that his wife has run during his absence has certainly grown. After the war, L'Oréal is clearly a prosperous business. But Eugène Schuller, while acknowledging his wife's role during the war, doesn't for a moment envisage her working at his side. He was really a man of his time, and his attitudes to women and the position of women in the business were not at all enlightened. A woman's place was the family, the children, the home, the kitchen. And so Betsy, from that point, had no further role at L'Oréal. It's true that at the end of the 20s, Lilian Betancourt's father is very similar to most men of his generation. Like them, he finds it entirely natural that women don't have the right to wear pants or graduate from high school, no right to vote or to open a bank account or to work without their husband's permission. But the founder of L'Oréal is intelligent and above all has intuition. After the Great War, women who had to manage without their lords and masters who left for the front have changed. They've acquired bad habits, started to emancipate themselves, 
and that's clear even in their looks. Mentalities change, bodies become free, fashion loosens up, clothes are more simple, less constraining. It's the era of Coco Chanel, striped sweaters, short hair too, a real hair revolution. And hair dye goes from not having a very good reputation, apart from with women of loose morals, to almost becoming an everyday product. Eugène Schuller gazes in astonishment on these years known as the Roaring Twenties. And with the same lack of soul searching that would lead him later to hang out with criminals, he decides to accompany this movement, accepting, without giving up on his own phallocentrism, that women make his fortune. I think that Schuller, to begin with, didn't really think about women at all. He wasn't interested in them. What interested him was his work. Because of the kind of work that he happened to find himself in and that made him rich so fast, he had to think about the position of women, which was something that didn't particularly interest him. That attitude is interesting because Eugène Schuller never imagined L'Oréal, directed by the daughter he would have, by Liliane. Born in 1922, the future Liliane Bettencourt quickly understands that her role will always be marginal in the empire her father is constructing. Although she sees his factories staffed by a female workforce, it's clear that being Eugène Schuller's daughter probably means her destiny is inactivity. It affected her life in two enormous ways because he thought that if you had a successful business, it shouldn't be passed on as part of an inheritance, that money should be inherited, but that a business shouldn't. He thought that the only way that for, to, to successfully run a business was if you um, started at the bottom and worked your way up. He's an early riser who gets up at four in the morning every day. He explains that he's a 6,000-hour man. For him, this is someone who works 16 hours a day, 365 days a year. He was so dedicated to his business. The other side of that was that socially, he was completely null. He wasn't interested in other people. He, he wasn't interested in social life. His wife died quite early on. Their, their daughter was only five years old. And he obviously felt a lack uh, because he thought that part of every successful man's mise en scène was a wife back at home making a nice home and looking after the children. So um, he looked around and found another wife. And who was this second wife? It was his daughter's English governess. Well, I mean, it's ridiculous. If he'd had the slightest social inclination, could have met anybody he wanted. But he, he simply had no interest. Perhaps he was slightly autistic. I don't know. After his wife's death, Apart from a few trips skiing or to the seaside, Eugène Schuller has neither the time nor the desire to take care of his daughter. Liliane lacks nothing except the essential, and as a passive witness to her father's success, she worships him in silence, without ever managing to break through his defenses. She had a very strict education. He's quite demanding, quite severe with her. She was at a Catholic boarding school. He made her intern at L'Oréal in the summer, sticking labels in the factory, then later at the headquarters on Rue Royale. So, I don't mean she was Cinderella, obviously. The new family lives near the Bois de Boulogne, on Boulevard Suchet, in a very wealthy district. They have a Rolls Royce with a chauffeur, Achille. Schuller builds a beautiful estate in Brittany, facing the island of Breha in 1926. As a result, she becomes a girl, then a teenager, who's rather shy, introverted, her social activities monitored, living in her own world. But for her whole life, and it's true even now, she remains absolutely fascinated by her father. In the interwar period, Eugène Schiller's fortune and his power continue to grow. This genius in business, Breton by adoption, launches new brands like Mont Savant and Dope shampoos, which become legendary. And he commercializes a product unknown until then, suntan cream. Ah, 
adoucit la peau. You know how he did that? He got a nasty sunburn out sailing on his yacht in Brittany. So he gets burned and he thinks, since I make lotions, can't I make a lotion that will block the sun's rays and stop you getting burned? He's a very good chemist, as we know, so he rapidly understands that it's the UV rays, etc. He thinks maybe I can create a sort of impermeable film that will block the damn UV rays and avoid coming back to L'Oreal HQ looking like a lobster. He focuses on that, finds the famous recipe for the anti-sunburn cream, and it's another big success. He really has the reflexes of a business leader. Thus, in 1936, as almost all company owners are ranting about the popular front and the introduction of paid holidays, Eugène Schiller understands that the social advances won by the strikes are just going to enable him to make more money. And just as women did when they took to his dyes, workers will contribute to his fortune as they set off for the first time on holidays in the sun, covering their bodies with a welcome dose of ambre solaire. This being said, make no mistake, Eugène Schuller, patriarchal boss and a true reactionary, had no sympathy whatsoever for the left and the trade unions. He didn't like the unions because a patriarchal boss is someone who's open, a boss who doesn't need unions, because if a worker has financial problems, he goes to see the boss, who gives him a bit of cash from his own pocket. Eugène Schiller, in fact, sees himself as a business theoretician, believing that one day he'll revolutionize the world of economics. His major concern is that the big bosses at that time, in the mining, steel, and automobile industries, didn't consider him a serious player. Because L'Oreal wasn't in the big league, it was beauty, nothing to do with big industry, and his theories were pretty much ignored. No one took up his ideas. No one took up his ideas, but some pretend to be interested. The fascists who are marching with increasing frequency in the streets. Eugène Schuller approves of them because he shares their liking for order and the cult of the leader. He had no real love for the Third Republic, for many reasons, nor for the democratic process. He used to say that democracy promotes the mediocre. He did actually say that unlike the Germans, we didn't have the luck to have Hitler, and that the Germans were years ahead of us because they had a fascist regime. The support of the founder of L'Oréal for Fascism is still a stain on the family history. And like Lady Macbeth, the Betancourts seem haunted by the extreme position of Eugène Schuller in 1940, notably an infatuation going back to the 30s with Eugène Delancle, one of the most sinister figures of the time. Delancle is an ex-royalist, member of an extremist monarchist group, very close to Charles Maurras whom he thinks is not hardline enough. And in 1935, he founds the PNR, the National Revolutionary Party. When the left-wing Popular Front emerges, the PNR becomes clandestine. Delancle transforms it into a secret committee known by the name La Cagoule, the mask. La Cagoule, without spelling out the detail, was known for terrorist activities. And I'm convinced, based on the archives available, that Schuller was one of the financial backers of La Cagoule. An attack on the headquarters of the French Employers Association meant to appear as a communist plot, murders of police officers, assassination of anti-fascist militants requested by Mussolini. Nothing deters Lilian Betancourt's father from his fascist adventure. Schuller finances this organization. He gives a lot of money to La Cagoule. And there are meetings at the L'Oréal headquarters, at the time at Rue Royale. 
There's no proof that Schuller participated in attacks, assassinations, or even that he was aware of any of those facts. But there is absolutely no doubt that he supported the organization. And Eugène Deloncle is constantly saying Schuller will be our minister of the economy. Actually, he's kind of a guarantee, a bourgeois at the heart of La Cagoule, which involves men like Jean Filiol, Jacques Corrèze, really abominable guys. Jacques Corrèze, who will soon advocate complete collaboration with the occupiers and will don German uniform at the Russian front. Jean Filiol, a Nazi agent before the war, condemned to death at the liberation for his crimes. Many years later, looking back on her father's infamous connections, Lilian Bettencourt, blinded by filial affection, will say he was a man driven by hope, pathologically optimist, who understood nothing of politics. He was always on the wrong ship. We could add that Eugène Schuller was nonetheless smart enough to never go down with the wrong ships he was sailing on. Thus, in 1937, when Eugène Delancle and more than 120 members of La Cagoule were arrested after attempting a coup d'etat against the Republic, Eugène Schuller slipped through the net and avoided investigation. June 1940, the Germans invade France, the armistice is signed, and Marshal Pétain prostrates himself before the invaders, who march into the capital as masters. Doubtless untouchable due to his importance to the French economy, Eugène Schuller considers the German invasion and Marshal Pétain's ascension to power to be, if not actually divine intervention, at least the lesser evil facing the threat of communism. At home in occupied Paris, he participates in all the collaborationist festivities, dining with the Commissioner General for Jewish Questions, the German ambassador, the head of the Vichy militia and Waffen SS on vacation. Lilian Betancourt and Eugène Schuller's supporters explain that he collaborated, as it were, accidentally on purpose. But there's unfortunately a certain amount of writings and things he said which are ideologically absolutely unambiguous. Indeed, absolutely unambiguous. In 1940, speaking at the RNP, Marcel Deas' neo-Nazi party, he calls for a purifying revolution, which could only be bloody, he emphasizes, before later adding, we need to agree on the fundamental point, and the fundamental point is a definitive break with the men of the Third Republic, with Freemasonry and with Jewry. Apart from those declarations, there's a rather astonishing document, a call to young French men to volunteer for the famous Legion of French Volunteers. It's one of the French units which joins the Waffen-SS fighting on the Russian front in the famous Charlemagne division. They wear German Nazi uniform and they swear an oath to Hitler. No one knows, obviously, how many young Frenchmen were actually influenced by these shameful statements. No one knows either how many of those called to fight with the Nazis realized that, in fact, Eugène Schiller's primary and main concern was to ensure the prosperity of his own empire. L'Oréal's revenue quadrupled during the war which demonstrates the benevolent attitude of the invaders, because an enterprise could not obtain fuel, transport, raw materials without the blessing of the occupying forces. He was also the head of a company called Valentine, which manufactured paints, varnish. Cosmetics are not strategic, but paint during wartime is an extremely strategic product, because no battleship sails out of the port without paint, no airplanes leave the runway without paint. And according to the records I've studied, up to 65% of Valentin's paint production during the war went to the Kriegsmarine, the Nazi Navy. In 1944, when finally Germany begins to collapse and Paris is liberated, Lilian Petencourt's father already knew for some time that the wind had changed and that he could be held responsible. Like almost all of the major heads of enterprise, he skillfully prepared himself 
counting on his connections and his fortune more than on his personal merits to escape the post-war purges. After the war, Eugène Schiller was initially condemned by the Purge Committee at the Liberation for collaboration and fraternizing with the enemy. He was condemned in 46. At that point, the possibility was raised of nationalizing the business. Then a year later, Eugène Schiller produces witnesses, testimony that he helped Jews, hid Jews in his own home, helped resistance fighters well before the end of the war. His explanation being that he was double-dealing the Germans. He had top-level character references, notably Pierre de Benouville, a hero of the French resistance who had also been, like Eugène Schuller, on the extreme right before the war. Not all the Cagoule militants were pro-German. Some became resistance fighters, joining General de Gaulle or the resistance, and that's what Benouville did. He testified that Schuller had supported the resistance financially from the beginning of the war. I don't know anything about the reality of that financial support, but that ultimately saved Eugène Schuller, and he was definitively cleared in 48. Among the support Eugène Schuller receives at that time, we can note the names of two young and ambitious figures who met before the war at 104 Rue de Vaugirard in a hostile run by Catholic priests. Two guys 40 years his junior, who decide to bet on the boss of L'Oréal, André Betancourt and François Dahl. André Betancourt recounts that he knew Eugène Schiller before the war. He was the go-between. André Betancourt and François Dahl testified in support of Eugène Schiller at the Liberation, confirming his argument that he was double-dealing, officially a collaborator but secretly supporting the resistance. What I know is that after the war, André Betancourt married Schuller's only daughter, and François Dahl became the CEO of L'Oréal. Dahl seduced Schuller the first time they met. It all happened very rapidly. He climbed very fast in the L'Oréal hierarchy because he had leadership skills, because he understood the world of business, and also something very modern, which is that he could conceive of a French company that could challenge American giants. Eugène Schuller and François Dahl worked together for many years, and thanks to them, L'Oréal entered the 50s stronger than ever. The company has one core objective, to make France clean, a real public health mission. When you look at France in the 30s, then during the war, then again in the 50s, one thing is striking. It's that France was dirty. French monuments were black. When you look at French films from that time, when they go into administrative offices or such like, it's dirty. There are papers lying around. You look at Clouseau's films, how people are dressed. And I think at the heart of L'Oréal, there was this desire to create cleanliness, to create something where people would be beautiful, would smell good, a desire to get rid of what embarrassed them. The statistics from that time are terrible when you look at them. Women wash their hair at most once a month. They did what they called a complete wash once a week. The level of hygiene was very low, which was an extraordinary opportunity for Schuller, who immediately understood that it was a change of era, a different world, and that cleanliness was something before beauty, in fact. That cleanliness in itself was something fundamental that had to be considered, and that's the starting point for his major advertising campaigns. Dop, Mont Savant, etc. It's not beauty, it's first and foremost cleanliness, physical well being. It's true that he's one of the pioneers of communication. From the 20s, he's using everything available songs, the press, cinema, radio, posters, 
He employs the best illustrators of the period, the best poster artists. Raoul Sauvignac starts out with the teats of the udder of the Mont Savon cow logo. He hired Raoul Villon, Charles Lupeau, their stars in their field. What's interesting is that, in fact, L'Oréal and Publicis started out together. I wouldn't say that L'Oréal invented advertising, but with Publicis they created a magnificent alliance to develop it together. Multiplying advertising campaigns, popularizing products with characters who rapidly become mythical, like little Rodolphe or the pinup girl Susie, bring a 1953 Oscar for advertising for Eugène Schuller. François Dahl, who has become his spiritual son, can feel proud too. Hired initially at the Mont Savant Company for half today's minimum wage, according to legend, François Dahl bounded up the L'Oréal hierarchy. Gradually, Eugène Schuller began to feel that this ex-law student, who had once dreamed of a career as a lawyer, could in fact become his successor. One could say that Schuller created L'Oréal, and Dahl made it what it is. He understood the company as a world unto itself, with social categories, employees, a functioning society. A company world, meaning that within this company, social relations between people, in a rather traditionalist vision, are characterized by respect. And François Dahl was respectful of people. He was respectful of people working in the firm. And that no doubt explains why the company grew in a climate of relative social harmony. They were builders, so there's this idea of building, of constructing. Take the example of hairspray. It's Dahl who had the idea of hairspray for women, and he developed it, Elnet and all those kinds of things, because he noticed one day, taking the subway, that women weren't wearing hats anymore. For decades, the idea of women with loose hair had been anathema socially. As soon as a woman reached a certain social status, she wore a hat. And suddenly, he noticed women weren't wearing hats anymore. So that's a bit of a simplification, an American-style success story. Maybe it didn't quite happen like that, but that's how he told it, and that's what he felt about it. And that's the moment when he had the idea of hairspray, which was a key element in L'Oréal's growth. And I think that that capacity to feel what society is constructing or experiencing is a very important point. Liliane certainly gets along well with François Dahl, but she falls in love with his alter ego, André Betancourt, wedding him after a long engagement in 1950. At first, Liliane made André Betancourt wait a long time before she said yes. She would even say that she didn't want to be locked into a marriage. And when they chose her ring, she said, above all, not too tight. Liliane's father, Eugène Schuller, himself nouveau riche, a nouveau riche social climber, thought this son of provincial Normandy bigwigs was a good match, so he strongly encouraged the marriage. André is from a Norman Catholic family, bourgeois, traditionalist, 
They believe in the values of the land, eternal values, a yeoman ideal, the values of the writer Charles Maurras, almost. All that would be a strong influence on André Betancourt. André Betancourt attends a Catholic high school, Saint-Joseph, at Le Havre. He's a militant in the Catholic Young Farmers. Then he goes to Paris, to a Catholic hostel where he meets François Dahl and also François Mitterrand. Indeed, François Mitterrand appears unexpectedly in the story as an old friend of both François Dahl and André Betancourt, to the point where, astonishing but true, he was for a while chief editor of the L'Oréal magazine, Your Beauty. Before the war, they were the three musketeers, François Mitterrand, Betancourt and Dahl, at the Catholic hostel. And then after the war, a fourth musketeer joined them, Rousselet, like D'Artagnan. From a narrative point of view, it's a fourth republic story. Three became millionaires and the fourth president of the republic. For members of the provincial middle classes who arrived in Paris without any contacts, it's a sort of an amazing fairy tale ascent. They had very different careers, but Mitterrand would talk about their friendship to the end of his life. It transcended political parties. They never failed one another. They returned each other's favors. They never lost contact. Until their deaths for years, André Betancourt, François Mitterrand and François Dahl had a dinner every year. Monsieur Mendes-France a enlevé l'investiture de l'Assemblée en réunissant sur son nom l'importante majorité de 419 suffrages. In 1954, Pierre Mendes France arrives in power and François Mitterrand helps André Betancourt become a junior minister. Plus, as a member of the National Assembly, André Betancourt was always extremely supportive when Mitterrand was criticized by the right. For example, when they rekindled the controversy over his Vichy regime medal and his links with the regime at the start of the war. They did, however, clash on occasion. For example, in 81, when Betancourt visited his old friend Mitterrand to complain about the new tax on the very wealthy. And Mitterrand said, well, I'll see, I'll mention it, but frankly, you and Lillian are not going to die of hunger. It's important to remember that André Betancourt benefited enormously from his wife's fortune. She financed his political career, his gorgeous shoes, his cigars, his fabulous lifestyle. And we can attribute his presence in a certain number of right-wing governments to his habit of financing political parties, also with Lilian's money. It's clear that the Betancourts were always close to power. For starters, André Betancourt was a minister or secretary of state several times, and given his friendships, he always helped politicians. He continued in the same spirit as Eugène Schuller, who always said, to succeed you have to be close to the state, close to those with power. C'est dans le site privilégié de la pointe de l'Arcouest, près de Paimpol, dans la propriété de M. Betancourt, que le président de la République et Mme Pompidou on passait de courtes vacances avant de regagner cet après-midi le palais de l'Élysée. Souriant et détendu, M. Pompidou devait observer « Je suis très heureux d'être en Bretagne, il fait un temps splendide, je me baigne et fais de la voile. » The whole political class crowded to his house. He handed out envelopes. Everybody was happy. They certainly always supported the right and their allies, that's clear. But their support transcended party lines. Presenting a public image of a close-knit couple while enjoying enormous liberty in their personal lives on a daily basis, Lilian and André were nevertheless loving parents and attentive to their only daughter Françoise, born in 1953, although Liliane wasn't strongly maternal by nature. By 1957, when Eugène Schuller died, age 76, having made François Dahl his successor, the longevity of the lineage was secure for two generations, and Liliane, the sole heiress of L'Oréal, could devote herself to her future mission, incarnating the company, but not directing it. Something that really strikes me about the L'Oréal story, which is not stressed enough, and which is surprising, is this kind of moral inheritance of the company, which he entrusted to his daughter. 
He didn't just entrust what would become an immense financial inheritance. He entrusted a vision of the firm, leaving Liliane Betancourt the heiress to legitimacy of the firm as if it were a kingdom, with the lifetime responsibility of ensuring that L'Oréal remain a French company. So many heirs sell their business to anyone, any way they can, to maximize the value of their inheritance. Liliane Betancourt didn't do that, not just because she inherited a considerable fortune, but as a matter of conviction. Her life is structured by the memory of her father. She adored her father, and she worships her father. She admires him deeply. She's always defended him, including in the darkest areas, the blackest moments of his past. And she wants the torch of family history to be carried forward. In her own way, she found her role as the guardian of the temple. Liliane, guardian of the temple, priestess tending the sacred fire and, like so many women of her social class, devoted to the worship of the two men destiny chose for her, her father and her husband. Luckily, her husband, especially when he became a deputy minister of foreign affairs, traveled a lot. She was amazed by going to visit Mao with André Betancourt. There's a fictional element there too, a literary tradition familiar to young girls who grew up reading books and all their lives continued to read books. Those women also lived adventures. They experienced adventures via men in a relationship which is the one they had been taught, that's to say that the women aided the men, but they lived adventures. And via André, she lived adventures. Via her father, she lived adventures. They were ultimately on a par with the adventurers they accompanied. Obedient little Liliane, who could have made and unmade kings, and who accepted without complaint the supporting role assigned by her father at birth. Did Liliane ever demonstrate any desire to direct the business? No one knows, and certainly she's never said anything about that. What she has shown is that she had the intelligence to always anoint directors who were very involved in the functioning of the enterprise, and with whom she always had excellent personal relations. With François Dahl it was easy, he was a close friend of her father. Monsieur Dahl's successor was also someone very close, someone who had always been there. And then her choice was a Welshman, not even French, a Welshman directing L'Oréal. And today the director is someone who's entirely a L'Oréal product. She anointed each of these directors, and they've always been, I believe, extremely faithful to the owner. It's a family business, ultimately, so there's this need to incarnate, identify the enterprise. It has an owner, Liliane is L'Oréal. So for 20, 30 years, everyone said, L'Oréal is Madame Liliane Betancourt. It's really like a royal family. She inherited the crown. Her duty is to transmit L'Oréal, to make L'Oréal prosper as much as possible, and to transmit this patrimony to her descendants. That's her duty. Apart from that, there's pleasure. For her, pleasure is traveling, going to exhibitions, the theater, meeting artists, because she can meet who she wants. And she likes that. They were part of the enlightened right. They hosted everybody. Liliane was always very delightful. It was very pleasant, frivolous. It was all society relations. Well, not society, more social relations. They were very socially open, rather brilliant. They weren't show-offs, it wasn't extravagant. But they were people who were out and about, who were at all the big Parisian events, who hosted intimate dinners. The whole of Who's Who paraded down Rue de la Bordère to dine in the notorious Art Deco mansion in Neuilly. The Betancourt Mansion, which the whole of France discovers at the start of the 2000s, and the few journalists who have occasionally been invited to enter describe as a place which is out of the ordinary. As soon as you go through the gate of this mansion, which is a closed gate, you can't see through it, you really have the impression you've arrived somewhere different. 
It's not really even nay anymore. You're almost in the country, in a rarefied environment. You have this physical feeling of being in another world. It's very velvety. There's absolutely no sound inside. It's incredible. Although there are a lot of people. I mean, there are lots of servants, there are chauffeurs, cooks. You see maids passing, secretaries. It's both a private residence, a magnificent residence. I have to admit it's dizzy. The pictures, the paintings are splendid. Everything is very, very beautiful. And it's also an office. So Madame is busy working, Monsieur is busy working. Lilian Betancourt's life, it's not the life of someone who is well-to-do and who says, hmm, I think I'll go to the movies. That's not possible. She has an agenda like a minister. It's amazing to see daily life in the Betancourt home. There are meetings hour on hour, diary alignment between the two spouses. It's strange. Really, you enter a world. I think people don't imagine at all what it's like. Liliane receives a lot of visitors, and she knows that all these people, they're going to ask for money. For a hospital charity, for an apartment. She knows that very well, and she manages that very well. Indeed, Liliane has lived with that since she inherited, at her father's death, what was already an enormous fortune. And the directors of L'Oréal, starting with Lindsay Owen Jones taking the firm into the stratosphere of the French stock market, have not made her task easier, ultimately making her the richest woman in the world. How could she have imagined that only a few years later, her name would be linked to one of the most notorious scandals in recent French history? A scandal which would devastate her own family, then shake the Republic itself, implicating the highest authorities of the state in an improbable tragic comedy of which Lillian Betancourt herself would be the reluctant heroine. <laughs>